First of all, let me extend greetings to you in the matchless name of the Lord Jesus Christ and greetings from the Christ Reformed Baptist Church uh, in Louisa. It's a privilege and an honor to be here and to have this responsibility of offering a charge as I speak to Andrew and the congregation overhears uh, this charge to him. Uh, I would like to take as a focal point uh, for our text, 2 Timothy 4, and I invite you to turn there, 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5, and we'll approach that text in a few moments. As we gather for this important occasion in the life of Andrew and his family, as well as in the life of this church, I'm reminded of the significance of transitions and passages and times of taking up responsibilities in life. This is personally very striking for me today because it's been a humdinger of a weekend for my family. On Friday, we moved our fourth child into college in Williamsburg. And last evening, my oldest daughter was engaged to be married. Life has many milestones for individuals and for families and for churches. The Lord is today adding Andrew. Andrew, I was thinking about that. Andrew, the name in Greek means manly. Andrew was, of course, also the proto-apostle, the first apostle who introduced his brother, Simon, to the Lord. The Lord today is adding Andrew, your Andrew, to the presbytery, to the eldership of this church. It's a solemn responsibility, which like many important commitments in life is not to be entered into lightly or frivolously, but seriously and soberly. There is perhaps no more fitting passage for such an occasion than the Apostle Paul's words to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5. In fact, Pastor Wheeler used this same text for his charge to Greg back in February. I checked it on Sermon Audio. But I'm returning to it again as I speak to uh, Andrew. And so I want to read for us 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5, wherein the Apostle Paul writes, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. May God Bless today the reading and the hearing of his word, and let us join in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, as we stand today under thy word, we ask that you would humble us before it, that you would give us the illumination of the Holy Spirit, give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear, give us minds to comprehend. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 2 Timothy has been called the Apostle Paul's last will and testament. Paul is about to face death for Christ, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And as he had told others, for me to, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And he was about to experience that. In fact, just after the passage that I read in verse 6, he says, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And so uh, he's about to go to his death. But before he departs, he writes to Timothy, whom he has called in the opening of this little book in uh, chapter 1 and verse 2, 
my dearly beloved son. The Apostle Paul uses some of the last moments in his life to conduct something like a seminary class for Timothy in practical theology. What will he teach him? What will a seasoned minister want to say to an aspiring colleague in the ministry about what is important in the ministry to pursue? And we get to, through the miracle of the inscripturation of God's word, to look at this lesson plan for the ministry. As we look at this text briefly, we can divide it into four parts. First of all, in the opening verse, there is a charge to recognize, Andrew, that your ministry will be seen and evaluated by the Lord. Secondly, in verse 2, there is an initial exhortation to five key tasks in the ministry. Thirdly, in verses 3 and 4, there is a warning about wayward and fickle hearers. So we're going to spend less time on that. And then lastly, in verse 5, the fourth point, there is an additional exhortation in light of the difficulties that sometimes accompany this calling. And so I want to look at those points briefly as I can and know our time is limited for this charge. First of all, we want to look at the opening verse. A charge to recognize that your ministry will be seen and evaluated by the Lord. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is reminding Timothy that his ministry is going to be conducted before an audience of one. He does not say, I charge thee before the church or before your family or before your neighbors, but before God. And by the way, this verse is an example of high Christology because Paul puts together here, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, before God and God. Amen. We live our lives, quorum deo, before the face of God. Andrew, pursue a ministry that is pleasing in the sight of God. Back in chapter 2 and verse 15, Paul had said to Timothy, Encourage him to be a workman that needeth not be ashamed. You may be able to fool some of the people all the time and all the people some of the time, but you can fool God none of the time. Be sincere. Be earnest before the Lord in your ministry. Do it for his glory and not for your own or any advantage that might be get, come to you or even to your church. You know the story about the artisan who was carving and chiseling the ornate statuary that went atop the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. When he was asked why he took so much care with such detail that would never be seen from the ground, he replied, I'm not worried about the view from below, but that which is from above. This exhortation comes also with a warning. Accountability helps most of us. After Paul says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, who shall judge the quick or the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom? Accountability helps most of us. We are charged to conduct our ministry before the Lord Jesus who will come again to judge. He will appear. He will have a kingdom and it will be glorious and we will give an account Consider what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11 and following. He said, For other foundation can no man lay than that that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Will it be gold and silver or will it be hay and stubble that will be consumed? He says in verse 14 of that same passage, If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. Consider also James's exhortation. It's one that we were ministers shudder before when we read it. James 3, 1, My brethren, be not many masters or teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. 
First, then, is remember that your ministry is before the Lord. Secondly, you have an initial exhortation to five key tasks of the ministry in verse 2. The first of those is preach the word. The verb is keruso. Proclaim, publish, herald, preach the word. There's a reason that this is first in that list. Preaching is a pride of place in the ministry of an elder. In 1 Timothy 3.2, which Greg ably read earlier, we're told that a bishop is to be apt to teach. Your first task is not administration, it's not counseling, it's not social work, it's preaching. Amen. Sometimes people debate, would you rather be a good pastor or a good preacher? But if you're not a good preacher, you can't be a good pastor. When you preach, you do pastoral work for a large group of people at once. You counsel, you comfort, you exhort a large group of people at once. This is the wisdom of God. And you also bear witness at once. And what do you preach? Not yourself, not politics, not self-help. You preach the word, which means the scriptures, but also through the scriptures, the living word, the word made flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul also wrote in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 21 and following, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Never shortchange your calling to preach and take every opportunity to do so. Amen. Second, be instant, in season and out of season. We could render this phrase as stand firm in good times. The Greek word is eukairos. And in bad times, ah, kairos, an alpha privative in front of the word for time. In good times and in bad times, stand firm. I did a podcast interview just last week with D. Scott Meadows, who has been the pastor for 31 years at the Calvary Baptist Church Reformed in Exeter, New Hampshire. He's been 34 years in the ministry. He's from West Virginia, been up in, in the Northeast and in, in New England for 34 years of ministry, 31 years in one church. And I asked him in the podcast interview, I said, Scott, what's the, what's the secret of your pastoral longevity? And he said, when he, when he became the pastor of that church, he said, I made a vow that I would never run from trouble in the church. And he said, when times were bad, I stayed because I didn't want to break my vow. And when times have been good, I didn't want to leave. Be instant, in season, and out of season. Third of these five tasks, reprove. The verb here has a wide range of meaning, to bring to light, to expose, to set forth, to convict, to convince, to point out, and also to correct and to discipline. The fourth of these five tasks in verse 2, rebuke. This verb has the sense of to warn, to censure, to punish. We could put these two together. Reproof and rebuke take courage and they also take wisdom and gentleness. We must not be like bulls in a china shop with men's souls and their minds and hearts. Look earlier at what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. And so... Uh, we are to reprove and to rebuke, but with gentleness. Fifth, and lastly in verse 2, he says, exhort. The verb here is parakaleo, and that verb in Greek has sort of two sides to it. There's, there's kind of a hard side. It can mean to admonish. On the other hand, there's a kind of a soft side to it, which can mean to comfort. And so he adds here in verse 2, exhort. And he gives two means through which you might do that. 
exhort with all long suffering. With all long, so long suffering. This means you must bear with the flock and you must be patient with them. Just as a parent expects age appropriate behavior from his children, not treating a toddler like a teenager or a teenager like a toddler, so you must render patient and appropriate pastoral care to this flock, these precious lambs that you'll be working with. You are also to exhort with right doctrine. You are called not only to preach, but also rightly to divide the word, as Paul puts it in chapter 2 of verse, and verse 15 of 2 Timothy. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing or rightly interpreting the word of truth. This means that your call will, re will require a lifetime of study, reading, writing, and reflection to learn the truth. And then to convey the truth which you have discovered with those who are eager to receive it. The third of the four points then, as we move on to verses 3 and 4, and I'm going to spend less time on this. But let me just read it once again. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. You must not be a man who puts his finger in the air and changes his doctrine depending on the way that the wind blows. You will want to take consideration of the needs of the flock in feeding them, but you must not let the flock dictate to you what you will preach. Sometimes, you will have to preach things that they don't want to hear and that you're reluctant to say because you're a kind and good man. But sometimes you'll have to say those things. Again, I'm not going to linger there, and we've got a brother who's going to charge the church. Let's go on to the fourth point in verse 5. And here we have another set of exhortations. The Apostle Paul never tires of giving exhortations, does he, uh, towards the work of the ministry. And so in verse 5, we have four exhortations that are given. And here it begins, first of all, with, But watch thou in all things. The verb here is nepho, which can be rendered as to be sober, to, we, to be well balanced, to be self-controlled. Spurgeon had a lecture in his lectures to his students titled, The Minister's self Watch. The minister's self watch. This reminds us that you are to be a good steward of your life. You're to be a good steward of your physical health. You're to be a good steward of your family. You don't need to spend all of your time pursuing the church ministry. You've got the family ministry, building your own family into a little church. That's a huge part of your ministry. And Paul stressed it so much in 1 Timothy 3. Watch thou in all things. Be sober. Be healthy in the way you conduct your life. In 1 Timothy 4.16, Paul said, Take heed unto thyself and unto thy doctrine. Maintain a healthy life and maintain healthy doctrine. Secondly, of these four exhortations in verse 5, he says, endure afflictions. Endure afflictions. Andrew, I have to tell you this, the ministry involves suffering. The ministry necessarily involves suffering. This is true of the ordinary Christian life, after all. If you look at 2 Timothy 3.12, the Apostle Paul had written, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's not maybe they will, but they will suffer persecutions. But the ministry has peculiar areas in which you will experience suffering. In 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul 
offers a long catalog of all the sufferings that he had endured as an apostle. And they included things like shipwrecks and beatings and starvation. But towards the end of the list, in, in uh, verse 28, he writes in 2 Corinthians 11, Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. How do you know if you're an elder? It's when you wake up thinking about the flock, Amen. worrying about them, concerned. And again, it can be pastoral concerns. And also it can be concerns that things aren't right with them. Things aren't right with them in the church. And you, you're going to bear this. It can be an affliction. It can be suffering. And there are also sufferings that come through conflict, sufferings that come sometimes from our own immaturity and sin or the immaturity and sin of others. Paul exhorts Timothy to endure such things, to persevere in such things. Spurgeon has another great article for the young ministers in his preacher's college. It was titled, The Minister's Fainting Fits. Even Spurgeon, the great Spurgeon, had times when he grew despondent and despairing in the ministry. And ministers can go through fainting fits, times of despair, the despair of their own progress, of the progress of the church. I remember years ago, probably more than 15 years ago now, I was going through a particularly painful time of conflict in the ministry. And it was over Christmas, and my family went down to North Carolina to visit my in-laws. And while we were there, I wanted to just go to a good church. And um, I looked up a, a, a Reformed Presbyterian church in nearby town, and I just slipped in there for the morning worship. Just wanted to go to a good regular principal worship service. And uh, the minister, you know, it's, it's like the Sunday, I don't know if it's before or right after Christmas, and in good reformed <laughs> uh, pattern, he's not preaching the nativity story. He's preaching the, 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 the sufferings of Christ and the cross of Christ. And I was sitting there sort of hanging my head, feeling sorry for myself. And he was, he was describing Christ on the Via Della Rosa and how Christ was mocked and, and spat upon. And uh, he, he said, to the congregation, not knowing I was there, he said, "I don't, I don't know what you might be going through, what you might, be, what what you might be suffering. You haven't suffered anything compared to the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ." And it humbled me. It reminded me that there is one uh, who has suffered for us, and there was one who was reviled and did not revile in turn. And so it was an encouragement to me. And so I encourage you with that thought as well. Thirdly, the third of the four exhortations in verse 5, he says, do the work of an evangelist. Do the work of an evangelist. Calvin held that the world evangelist here referred to an extraordinary office held by apostolic associates like Mark and Luke who wrote gospels and also to men like Timothy and Titus. But part of that call is a call to make plain the gospel as people like Mark, Luke, Timothy, and Titus did. That is, do the work of evangelists. Be concerned about the souls of men. Convey to them that their only hope is, in the end, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Fourth and finally, the last exhortation in verse 5, make full proof of thy ministry. The verb here can mean to fulfill or to realize. Fulfill or realize your ministry. Interestingly enough, the word for ministry here is diakonia. Uh, usually refers to diaconal service, the work of the deacons. Um, but it often, in the, uh, Paul's writing especially, refers generally to the ministry. Diaconal ministry, presbyterial ministry. Um, one thing it reminds us of when it says fulfill your ministry is that there's no task for the, for the elder in the church that is below him. Um, when there aren't enough deacons to do the work, guess what? Elders are deacons too. And we fulfill our ministry. We do whatever it takes uh, to serve the people of God. So there's no task that's below us in the church. And though it's also a reminder 
you know, more widely that you're supposed to fulfill your ministry, Andrew. You're not Brian Wheeler. You're not Luke Peterson. You're not Greg McGonigal. You are not stamped today with a ministry, Reformed Baptist ministry cookie cutter. God in his wisdom made you. He saved you. He equipped you. And now he's calling you to this peculiar ministry. And he's designed you in a unique manner to serve the needs of this body and to fulfill the ministry to which he has called you here to do. If you fulfill it, it will be Andrew's ministry and not anyone else's. By the way, I wanted to say when I was talking about afflictions, let me also add, don't let me, don't let me overspeak that because there are also manifold blessings in the ministry. I didn't say that earlier. Oh my goodness. Manifold blessings for you and for your family. When you administer the ordinances, when you see persons come to faith, when you see the body working in harmony. I've, I've sent my children off to college and as we've talked with them and they've all gone to their new places to live and found churches and one of the things that have come back they said dad I really miss being a minister's kid because when you're a minister's kid you know everything that's happening in the church <laughs> they said it's so strange to go into church and be there and not really know what's going on and it was so great to be in the home and have you know visitors and missionaries and pastors and members of the church come into our home oh it's a wonderful privilege uh, it's a wonderful privilege McCaskill family Susan it's a great privilege to be an elder's wife so there are manifold blessings to being in the ministry alongside of those afflictions as well but the the blessings oh so far outweigh any afflictions that might come upon us well I was ordained to the ministry in November of 1992 nearly 30 years ago and in the ordination service for the ordination service, I wrote a hymn, which I titled This Noble Task, and it can be sung to the common meter tune, and we occasionally sing it within our church. And here were the, the words that I wrote 30 years of that, uh, ago, based on 1 Timothy 3. To all who would this noble task take up in view of call. One thing the noble master asks is that you give up all. We give up all we've loved the best, our pride, our wealth, our fame, and find that God has given rest and made our losing gain. With empty hands, we go to work. The task before us lies to help those who in shadows lurk and open blinded eyes. This task is not for one alone, but for the church entire, for all on whom Christ's flame has blown and built a burning fire. I charge you before God and before the Lord Jesus Christ to take up this task. Amen. Amen.